Now our scripture reading this morning from the gospel according to Mark chapter 3, and you'll find this passage in the Pew Bible, page 838, and there should be a copy in the Pew Rack in front of you of the English Standard Version, which we customarily use. And for our children who have their children's Bible, uh, the passage is on page 1215. As you're turning there, let me remind you of our evening service here at six o'clock. Uh, if you're a visitor, uh, then this is very much the climax of our day. Uh, we have a well-filled room for our evening services and wonderful opportunity to worship and for mutual encouragement with one another. And uh, we're in the middle of a series of sermons on the book of Ezra, but we're taking a two-week break from that uh, for two sermons that we hope will be of special help to those who are not yet Christians uh, or those perhaps with whom you've been speaking. And so tonight I'm going to preach on the subject, When All Roads Lead to God. Um, I'd be surprised if you haven't heard somebody use that expression, when all roads lead to God. There is, of course, a very important sense in which all roads do lead to God, but uh, that's not actually the greatest issue, and we're going to consider that tonight. But this morning, let's hear God's Word from Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 3, and the first six verses. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they, that is the Pharisees of whom we read in verse 6, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus, how to destroy him. We're in the course of a short series of studies, September and October together, entitled The Real Jesus, The Emotional Life of Our Savior. And we are doing this for the simple reason that unless we have a sense of that emotional life of Jesus, Jesus will by and large remain to us as a figure in a stained glass window. The New Testament, and especially the Gospels, present to us a Jesus with emotions. And most of us in our own experience find it very difficult to get to know somebody who never expresses any emotion. We want handles to hold on to. And if we are to get to know our Lord Jesus Christ, His emotions are handles for faith to hold on to. And we've thought, first of all, about Jesus' sense of surprise, eh, which is itself, for many of us as Christians, surprising. We never expected that the Jesus of the Gospels would be surprised. But His heavenly Father, we saw, surprised Him by doing something in the life of a Roman centurion that nothing human could ever have prepared Jesus to expect. And he expressed amazement that here was a Roman centurion with greater faith than anyone he had seen in Israel. And then we moved on to everybody's favorite, Jesus' compassion, the wonder of his tenderness of spirit and heart to those who are in need. But today, Jesus gets angry. Jesus 
gets angry. Anger, of course, is a deep emotional expression of antagonism and opposition. Somebody has described it as the gunpowder of the soul. And I think, therefore, inevitably, I find myself asking, and you may also find yourself asking with me, do I believe in a Jesus who got angry? Do I believe in a Jesus who might get angry again? And here, rather obviously, in the statement that Mark makes, very specific, as Jesus surveyed the scene in the synagogue at Capernaum where he was, he looked around them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. There are actually several occasions in the Gospels where Jesus seems to have expressed different kinds of anger. Perhaps the best known one is, of course, when his disciples tried to stop the parents bringing their young children to the Lord Jesus, perhaps because they thought he was too important and they were too unimportant, he was too busy, or they were too important. And you remember that Jesus was angry he was angry with an indignation. And most of us want to stand up and cheer Jesus, don't we? How dare they keep little children from meeting Jesus? And then sometimes we swallow hard and realize what we have just said, because we ourselves have often been like the disciples and kept little children from meeting Jesus. So Jesus' indignation, or here, even stronger language, it would seem. Jesus' anger is perhaps for you one of the more difficult emotions in Jesus to be able to handle. But at the end of the day, you can't pick and choose your own Jesus. That would make him a figment of my imagination. I like the idea of a compassionate Jesus, uh, but I, I'll do without a Jesus who ever got angry but uh, that would be making up your own Jesus. And at the end of the day, your own Jesus is not the Jesus you need. My own Jesus is not the Jesus I need. And so, as we, as we move into this, I want us to do it somewhat slowly because it's so important that we grasp, I think, in the first instance in this passage, the significance of the context in which it's set. Sometimes when you and I get angry, there is just a total explosion, and the people standing around are saying, now what on earth caused that? But there is a context here. There is a, there is a build-up here that helps to explain the particular situation in which Jesus here gets angry, because chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Mark's gospel are full of what we sometimes call conflict stories, in which Jesus finds himself early in his ministry being opposed and opposed by a particular group of people, the Pharisees here. Earlier on in chapter 2, uh, he had gloriously healed a paralyzed man, and uh, they had they had, they had snidely remarked that he was committing blasphemy. And then one of my own favorite stories in the Gospels, this may tell you more about me than it does about the Gospel story. The disciples are walking through the fields on a Saturday afternoon, the equivalent of our Sunday afternoon, and they're doing what you do when you walk in the country. You see a few berries, or you see the corn, or whatever it is, and unthinkingly they pick some of it up and start munching it. It's the kind of thing you do naturally. Suddenly a whole band of Pharisees jump up from without the sheaves and, ha ha, caught you, caught you. How dare you break the Sabbath by reaping and grinding on the Sabbath day. Of course, they don't say anything about Jesus directly. But of course, people never do, do they? 
They point the finger at the disciples, but the innuendo is, you're responsible for these guys. You are a Sabbath breaker. I was once, uh, it may be of interest to you, accused in the seminary in which I taught by a student from another part of the world of being a Sabbath breaker because I referred to Jack Nicholas in the course of one of my lectures and found myself guilty by association in all kinds of ways. Uh, churches have people I call pouncers, you know. And it was so in the church to which the Lord Jesus belonged. And the Pharisees, as we know, were a, they were, they were a conservative group of people. Their driving passion was to protect their religion from the incursions of the secular world. Uh, the Jews had been an oppressed and marginalized people by empire after empire, and there had been all kinds of concessions, you know, to the modern world. We can't live in the old way that God determined in the modern world. We've got to compromise. And the Pharisees were the people who said, enough is enough. And so they determined that there would be certain fixed points in their lives on which they would never compromise. And among these were the principle of the kosher food laws, and uh, it seems uh, in, their, in their giving they tithed. If you remember the story that Jesus told of the Pharisee and the publican, uh, you can't read that story as a minister or as an elder in a church without having a sneaking feeling it would be terrific to have a congregation full of Pharisees because the church budget would just go through the roof. And of course, the other thing that was such a big marker in their lives was the way in which they kept the Sabbath day. And they were so committed to this that they would die rather than yield these points, and some of them actually did die. Not all of them, as a matter of fact, were the nasties like this group. Nicodemus, for example, came to Jesus by night. He was a Pharisee and said, Jesus, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. I want to understand you better. But these particular Pharisees, of whom we read dominantly in the Gospels, were men who were so rigorously committed in this instance to the Sabbath day and Sabbath observance, that one of the things that made them profoundly suspicious about the Lord Jesus is that He talked so infrequently about the law of God. He hardly ever seemed to mention the law of God. He, he spoke about it, if He spoke about it, as being fulfilled in Him, and how His own disciples actually had a righteousness that was superior to the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And uh, here they were on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. I once years ago went to speak at a conference. The subject I'd been asked to speak on was a slightly controversial subject at that time. I went to the conference. I'd been at this conference before, and as soon as I arrived at the conference, I thought, there are too many people here. I know the number of people who are prepared to come and listen to me at conferences, and I knew there were too many people there. And I thought, I think there are spies here. And interestingly, I discovered within a week from thousands of miles away, the other part of the world, that I'd been absolutely right. There had been spies there. And when there are people with the spying spirit, you can usually feel it in the very atmosphere of an occasion like this. I think this must have been one of the most claustrophobic experiences of Jesus' early ministry as He, as he casually goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and uh, perhaps thinks to Himself, 
There are too many people here. Oh, now I understand. They are here. The spies are here. The opponents are here. And he sees the man with the withered hand of whom we read. Had had his presence been engineered? But he is in the synagogue this Saturday. And Jesus clearly thinks, now I understand. So what does he do? Do you know the first thing he does is this? He embarrasses the man with the withered hand. There they are in the synagogue, the prying eyes, the excited people. You know how excited we get when we know there's going to be a fight? Uh, The people were excited. Something special was going to happen in the synagogue this particular Saturday. And the first thing Jesus does is He embarrasses the man with the withered hand. How do I know that? I know that because I've known people with withered hands. They sit in particular places in churches. They deport themselves in in particular ways. They're actually sometimes known as, I can't remember what his name is, but he is the man with the withered hand. And Jesus says in the middle of the service, I'd like the man with the withered hand to come and stand in the center of the synagogue. It's dramatic beyond words. What I want you to notice in passing is this, that Jesus does do this kind of thing. A couple of chapters later on, He'll actually do it again. Remember the woman who touched the hem of His garment and was instantaneously healed? She could have gone home, and she would have been as well as ever woman could be. She had been suffering for years and years, and she would have been beautifully transformed just by touching the hem of Jesus' robe. But actually, Jesus stopped and embarrassed her, called her out of the crowd, because He wanted her to understand that it wasn't the magic in the hem of His robe, but the power of His saving grace on which she had tightly, if not altogether fully understandingly held, that had brought her the salvation, the wholeness, the healing of her body. And there's a great lesson for us here, because if you're a Christian, you will discover this, if you've not discovered it already, that there are times when Jesus will have you embarrassed. It's not actually possible to be a Christian, I don't think, in this kind of society, and not to find yourself in a situation of embarrassment because of the Lord Jesus. What I want you to notice is that the Lord Jesus never does this kind of thing without planning great good through the embarrassment. In a sense, greater good through the embarrassment than we could ever have tasted without it. And so, this is a clash between men who are hostile to the Lord Jesus, and in the midst of it, the thing that is so beautiful and the thing that by His Spirit He begins to impart to us is the sheer poise of the Lord Jesus. As He calls the man into the middle of the room, and then people begin to hold their breath. I want you to think now not just about the general significance of the context, but to focus with me for a moment on the critical attitude of the Pharisees. Because what is going on here is that the Pharisees who have so committed themselves to careful Sabbath observance have asked the kind of question that people tend to do. Now, Christians, I find, tend to ask this from time to time about Sunday. So, what should we do on Sunday? What's the appropriate thing to do on Sunday? And the Pharisees would have been able to tell you exactly what had been appropriate. And what the issue here is, 
is that engaging in the practice of medicine, which is work, would be inappropriate. Now, of course, there would be exceptions. Um, You can't stop a baby being born on Saturday afternoon. Uh, There would be other exceptions if somebody had particular symptoms that would be suspiciously serious. Then, in order to save life, you could practice medicine. Uh, but a man with a withered hand had a man, was a man with a withered hand on Friday, and he would be a man with a withered hand on Sunday. So you can sort him on Sunday if you're capable of sorting him, but do not transgress the Pharisees' interpretation of the Sabbath law by healing this man on Sunday, on Saturday. And everybody in the room knows that this is the issue. The man knows this is the issue. The congregation knows this is the issue. Jesus knows this is the issue. How deeply offensive it's going to be to these Pharisees if Jesus heals this man on Sunday, on Saturday. I'm too much of a New Testament Christian, am I? Now, here's something that's, this is, you know, do you think Jesus is an idiot? He doesn't understand what's going on. Do you notice what he does? He heals him without actually breaking the Pharisee's interpretation of the law. There's nothing against speaking, and that's all he does. He doesn't even touch him. He just says, stretch out your hand. Even in the Pharisees' law code, there's no law against speaking. All he's asking the man to do is to shake his hand. But what's the real issue here? Well, Jesus pinpoints it, doesn't he, in verse 4. Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or to kill. Now, they're there asking the question, is Jesus going to break the Sabbath or their interpretation of the Sabbath? As I've sometimes said to you, there is this, uh, there is this neat way of speaking uh, in the Jewish world. Why do rabbis always answer questions with questions? And the answer is, why not? And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's answering their question. Are you going to heal with his question? And his question is this. He says, verse 4, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? Now, actually, if you think about it, that isn't really enormously convincing. I think most of our lawyers would be saying, now, wait a minute here. And I'm sure all of the Pharisees would be saying, but we are not doing him harm. We are not killing him. But you see, Jesus wasn't really speaking about the man with the withered hand. He was speaking about them. It wasn't uh, questions about the Sabbath that he was talking about. It was questions about their heart. And one of the reasons we know that's true is in verse 6, immediately the Pharisees went out. They held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus, how to destroy him. You see what he's doing? He's doing the thing that uh, we hate Jesus doing. He's exposing their hearts. He's saying, you're here and you're saying to me, don't you dare heal this man on the Sabbath day because you shouldn't do this on the Sabbath day. And he's saying, uh, so is it better to heal or to harm, to save life or to kill? Because that's actually what you are here about. You actually have no interest in this man. They had no interest whatsoever in this man. Their interest was sharply becoming the interest. How could they get Jesus out of their vicinity, out of their lives, out of their synagogue, and out of this world. So there's a general context, there's a critical attitude, and this is why it leads to this reaction of anger in the Savior. Verse 5, 
Jesus, as they were silent, in their guilty silence, Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. There was something in his face, perhaps something in the way he spoke that told the disciples that uh, there was an emotion coming to expression in Jesus that they rarely saw. It was an emotion of deep hostility, of profound anger in the context of what these Pharisees were doing. And Mark explains it to us. He says, Jesus was grieved at their hardness of heart. It's interesting the New Testament uses more than one kind of expression to uh, describe hardness of heart, and the vocabulary the New Testament uses has come into the vocabulary of our doctors. The, the particular vocabulary that's used here uh, conveys the idea of a heart that… Uh, has become calloused. There is a protective, hard surface against the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And it's not difficult to see how that hardness developed. You know, you shake hands with, uh, shake hands with somebody who, who's uh, doing an office job and, or a minister you know, even hands of this age can feel quite soft, but you shake hands with a farm worker or a woodworker, then what do you feel? You feel the, you feel the hardness of the skin, the constant use and the hardness of the skin, the calluses that build up. And through some kind of exercise of heart, these calluses had been created in these Pharisees' lives. And what's so fascinating is what had created those calluses was their response to the Lord Jesus. In the previous couple of chapters, whenever he'd been in this region, he had shown that the kingdom of God had come, that the king had arrived, and that the kingdom was a kingdom of gracious restoration and life transformation and joy and privilege. And as they'd seen it strangely, they had resisted it, and the more they had seen it and heard of it, the, the more they resisted it, and the friction between their hearts and the grace and glory of the kingdom of Jesus and the person of Jesus, the more they found themselves in friction, the harder their hearts became. And now their hearts were so hard they were determined to be rid of the Lord Jesus. I've always been intrigued by the fact that in the parable that Mark records in the next chapter of the sower and the soils, you remember the seed of the Word falls on different kind of soil, that the, that the first path on which the seed, uh, the first part on which the seed falls is the pathway, and actually the pathway was the part that the farmer was walking on so frequently. That's one of the horrific things about being a preacher of the gospel. You know that the more you preach it, the more some hearts are going to be hardened against it. Because if Christ will not soften my heart and transform my heart and fill my heart with joy, then the friction of that message of grace that I resist produces in me a heart callousness. And this is what had developed in these Pharisees for all their zeal for all their conservative character, for all their commitment to things that seem to be so good, the real test of their heart condition was actually how they responded to Jesus. That was the heart test. Jesus was giving them the ultimate heart test by displaying again and again the grace and power and transformation of the gospel. And they were saying again and again, I won't have it, I won't have it, I won't have it. 
And you see what the result was and what made Jesus angry. It was that they ended up divorcing the laws of God from the gracious character and purpose of God. Just at the end of the previous chapter, Jesus had said, don't you understand from reading your Bible that the Sabbath was made as a gift for man? Man wasn't made to be squeezed into the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given to provide a, a gracious day in the week when hard-working man could be free from the pressures of his work. And you see, here they are. Here's a man who perhaps wasn't able to work the other six days of the week. Here's a man who must have found it difficult to hold down a job. I saw something in the news a few weeks ago of a man somewhere in rural China who'd made his own artificial limb. And it was about 30 times as heavy as an artificial limb would be here. And the sheer energy, the exhaustion of this poor man who was trying to eke out a living. And this is this man here. And they've got their laws. And you see, they, they not only divorce God's gracious character and purpose from their understanding of His laws, but you notice what they do? Do you see the echo here of what happened in the Garden of Eden when God said to Adam and Eve, this is a terrific garden and it's all yours. Enjoy it. But there's one thing, don't eat of that particular tree in the middle of the garden that we'll call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just, just enjoy the rest. And the serpent comes along and he says, has God set you in this garden with all these trees and said, you are not to eat of the fruit of any of these trees? You see what he's doing? God had given a command in relationship to the trees. Go and enjoy yourselves, but be obedient to me. And Satan, like these Pharisees, or better, these Pharisees like Satan, had turned God's generosity and liberality and graciousness into restrictiveness that inevitably meant that the God of whom they thought was as restricted in mind and spirit as they were restricted, and therefore He was utterly unlike Jesus. And at the end of the day, what their hearts were saying was this, it's either our God or Him as God. And despite all the overtures of grace, they refused Him. Perhaps some of you who are physicians have come home uh, to your wife one day, and she said, honey, how was it, uh, how was it today? And it's, it has just kind of blown up. Mr. So-and-so, I have been telling him now for years that unless he does this, he is going to die. And today, after I'd looked at the x-rays and had the test run, I had to tell him, you are now going to die. And I am so grieved. I'm angry about what has happened. Because he had all the counsel he needed, all the opportunity he needed, all the provision I would have given him, all the help that I pledged to him. And uh, that's what the Pharisees had done. Over a period of weeks, perhaps over a period of months, Every single move the Savior had taken was a move of grace. Every word He spoke, the people were amazed at the gracious words that proceeded from His mouth. Everything He did had this heavenly sense of the transforming power of the gospel that He preached. And all the time, they hardened their hearts. I remember hearing of... Uh, the great Welsh preacher John Elias, 
going in the old days when you took your BMW horse to the blacksmith rather than to the auto dealer, and he took his horse, his one horsepower auto to the blacksmith for the blacksmith to put a new horseshoe on his horse. And uh, there was this howling, howling as he approached the blacksmith's shop, as the blacksmith banged on his anvil, howl, howl. And when he got there, he realized the blacksmith had got a new dog. And a couple of weeks later, he had go back to his blacksmith for another shoe. And he heard the banging of the blacksmith on the anvil. And then when he went into the room, the dog was lying beside the anvil, fast asleep. That's how it goes. The tragedy of the situation is the thing in which we tend most to rejoice when God's Word penetrates into the conscience. And this was what was happening here. Jesus was such a conscience-penetrating presence and teacher of the gospel. And uh, the thing that happens is that uh, people just feel so relieved it's not touching their conscience so they can be happy. And they don't realize that Jesus has stopped speaking to them. And so they went out and sought to rid their lives of Jesus. And the tragedy is that the frown they must have seen on the face of the great physician did not move them to seek healing at his hands. When did the Lord last speak to you? Was there friction? My friends, as we look at this very challenging thought of Jesus being angry, if we sense His frown, let us run to His grace. And if you hear His voice, as the Scripture says, do not harden your heart. Lord Jesus, we stand amazed in your presence as you walk off the pages of Scripture and show us your majesty and your poise, your glory, and yes, as you show us your anger. We pray that whenever you frown upon our lives because we are resisting you, that we may have sufficient sensitivity of heart to turn to you. And we look to you today and cry to you to continue to speak to us that we may not drift and eventually become deaf. So hear us. We thank you that you have come. Thank you for all that it must have meant to that man with the withered hand to spend the rest of his life even among people who couldn't remember his name being described as the man who had the withered hand whom Jesus healed. Lord, whatever our pasts have been, however we have sinned and failed, we pray we may be those whom Jesus has healed, and we pray it in his name.